right, welcome to the uh, 2020 Ohio Island Book Festival. My name is Robin Nesbitt, and I am pleased to be the moderator for the Specular Fiction Panel. We want to thank our festival sponsors and partners, all of whom you can find listed at the Ohio Island website. Thanks to our official bookseller, The Book Loft of German Village. You can get copies of all the books featured at the festival by going online to bookloft.com. And now I'm pleased to welcome our authors. Uh, I, since I'm a libra former librarian, I'm retired. Uh, this is alphabetical because, you know, that's how we roll. So I'm going to start with Matt Betts. Matt was born and raised in Lima, Ohio, and went to college in Toledo. He currently lives in Columbus with his wife, Mackenzie, and their two wonderful boys. Growing up, Matt consumed vast amounts of pop culture. He read comics, watched cartoons, listened to various pop music, regularly viewed the old monster movies on weekend television, and read everything he could find. Matt's short and flash fiction has focused a lot on humor and horror. His work appears in Arkham Tales, Ethereal Tales, The Triangulation, Taking Flight Anthology, Bizarro Fiction, The Journal of Experimental Fiction 37, A Thousand Faces, and Cinema Spec Tales of Hollywood and Fantasy. Matt's poetry has also been published in numerous venues and was nominated for a Risley Award, the Science Fiction Poetry Association's highest honor. So that was his poem, Godzilla's Better Half. His poetry has also appeared in Starline, Escape Clause, The Book of Tentacles, Aluminum, the 2010 Risling Anthology, Flight of Trope, and others. One of his pieces was also mentioned in the New York Times article on zombie poetry. So, welcome to Matt. Hi. Now, Thanks for next, having me. <laughs> up next, we have Leanna Renee Heber, author, actress, and playwright. Leanna was, grew up in rural Ohio, inventing ghost stories. She graduated with a BFA in theater and a focus in the Victorian era from Miami University. She is the award-winning, best-selling author of over 13 gothic, gas lamp fantasy, and supernatural suspense novels for adults and teens, for Tor, Source Books, and Kensington Books, as well as the Darkness Space Opera's novellas for Scribe. A four-time Prism Award winner for excellence in the genre of fantasy romance, Leanna's short stories have been featured in notable anthologies, and her books have been selected for national book club editions, as well as translated into many languages. She lectures on gothic fiction and paranormal themes for prominent institutions such as New York University and at conventions and conferences. Welcome, Leanna. Next, we have Lucy Snyder. Lucy is the Shirley Jackson Award nominated and five-time Bram Stoker author award winning, winning author of 14 books and over 100 published short stories. Her most recent books are the collection Garden of Eldritch Delights, the, the forthcoming collection Halloween Season, and the forthcoming novel The Girl with a Star Stained Soul. She also wrote the novel Spellbent, Shotgun, Sorceress, and Switchblade Goddess, the nonfiction book Shooting Yourself in the Head for Fun and Profit, a writer's survival guide, and the collections While the Black Stars Burn, Sock Apocalypses, Orchid Carousels, Sparks and Shadows, Chimeric Machines, and Installing Linux on a Dead Badger. Her writing has been translated into several languages, and has appeared in publications such as Asimov's Science Fiction, Apex Magazine, Nightmare Magazine, Pseudopod, Strange Horizons, and Best Horror of the Year. She lives in Columbus, Ohio, and you can learn more about her at www.lucysnyder.com. Welcome, Lucy. Hi, everybody. Glad to be here. Last, but certainly not lot least, Dan Stout. Dan lives in Columbus, Ohio, where he writes noir with a twist of magic and a disco chaser. His prize-winning fiction draws on his travels throughout Europe, Asia, and the Pacific Rim, as well as an employment history spanning everything from subpoena server to assistant well driller. Dan's stories have appeared in publications such as the Saturday Evening Post, Nature, and Mad Scientist Journal. His debut novel, Titan Shade, is the first volume in the Carter Archives from Daw Books. Welcome, Dan. Thanks for having me. All right, so now that I've introduced everybody, how about we go through and have you guys talk a little bit about your most recent work. Uh, let's start with Matt, since I'm you know, going alphabetically. I'll mix it up a little bit as we go along. <laughs> All right, nothing wrong with being orderly. I mean, uh, to have a system, right? <laughs> Uh, my latest book is uh, Carson and the Venus, The Edge of All Worlds. Um, I'm really excited about it. It's um, probably the biggest book I've done so far. Uh, the publisher uh, put it out in paperback and hardback and a special edition and audio and all this stuff all at once. And it's, uh, it was a really big deal. And of course, like everybody else, I was excited to get out to those conferences and talk about it. And well, I didn't get to quite go out to all those conferences and do it, but um, the book picks up uh, a story that Edgar Rice Burroughs had started, or a series that he'd started uh, back in the early uh, 20th century. And uh, so I'm really excited to be able to do that. I, I'm working with Edgar Rice Burroughs, Inc., the, the company that holds all the rights for his stories and the movies and everything else. So uh, there, it's launching a brand new series of, of uh, 
stories that are going to be canon to, to Burroughs' work. So uh, it's a really exciting, uh, uh, you know, book and, and just all around experience for me. So I'm excited to talk about it. Great. Thank you. Leanna, what about your newest work? All right, I am thrilled, much like Matt. Um, it's really hard and, and kind of heartbreaking to have a book release in the middle of a pandemic, but I'm really grateful that all of us could be here virtually. And so I'm really grateful to all the organizations around the world that have pivoted to virtual programming. So thank you, Ohioana. Um, I'm, an, I'm a New Yorker, um, Ohioan always in my heart, um, but as a New Yorker, so this is, uh, it's a little easier to join you in this way, but um, I'm thrilled about my latest Spectral City novel. So. This is my beautiful new baby. Um, it's called A Summoning of Souls, and it is the third uh, and final book in the Spectral City trilogy. These are Gothic-inspired gas lamp fantasies. So that term means historical fantasy set in the gas lit era, late Victorian era, very atmospheric, very inspired by Gothic literature. Um, in this series, it stars a group of female psychic detectives and their favorite friendly ghosts who helped solve weird crime in 1899 Manhattan. I am a New York City tour guide, a ghost tour guide specifically. So a lot of my work as a ghost tour guide factors directly quite truly into my work as a novelist. And it's a wonderful uh, way to, you know, feed each other uh, supernaturally. So, um, and also I get to, you know, put in wonderful haunted and, you know, uh, non-haunted tidbits about history into the series. And so um, I definitely, as a cross-genre writer, that's one of the things I love to talk about, how um, speculative fiction can really merge a lot of different types of fiction within this overarching umbrella of, of speculative. So a lot of us have cross-genre elements in our work. So that's certainly in play with mine. So. Cool. Great. Sounds wonderful. Thank you. Lucy, what about your new work or latest work? My official Ohio Anna Library title um, is um, actually an anthology edited by Jennifer Brozak. It's called A Secret Guide to Fighting Elder Gods. Um, it's largely YA fiction, uh, and most of the stories have a decidedly Lovecraftian bent. Uh, some of the other contributors to the anthology are Shannon McGuire and Jonathan Mayberry. Um, and all the stories deal with uh, teens who are, in fact, trying to fight the elder gods in some way. Uh, my story takes place in Louisiana. And it's focused on a pair of cousins, um, uh, Pepper and Jake. Uh, Jake has been bitten by a Shoggoth, um, and he is slowly turning into one as a consequence. And so um, his uh, cousin, Pepper, has taken him to the back end of the bayou to see a medicine woman about um, curing his illness before he transforms. And the uh, cousins have to contend with uh, the dream witch Yidra in the process of this. So it's a fun action-oriented kind of story. Um, my other release, the one that I've been uh, talking about a lot on social media lately is my collection Halloween Season, which will be out in early October. And uh, this is a collection of uh, 15 pieces which uh, deal with Halloween or which are stories about tropes that you find uh, commonly like, you know, uh, in Halloween type of scenarios, you know, like, uh, you know, you have a lot of kids who dress up as zombies. So of course there's a zombie story in there. Of course, there's a story about witches, you know, things like that. So um, that's a more fun collection uh, than some of mine have been in the past. Um, so yeah. Great, that sounds wonderful. Thanks very much. Sure. Um, Dan, what about your latest work, your newest work? Sure, my uh, latest book just came out in April. It's called Titan's Day, and it's the sequel to my debut, and it's the next installment in my series from Daw called The Carter Archives, and that is a fantasy noir thriller with 1970s technology. So it's eight tracks and sorcerers and magic and monsters and uh, car chases. It's it's everything I love. Um, and it's uh, like Leanna was saying, it's all about uh, mashing up a bunch of different genres. So it's finding the way to hit the essential beats of a police procedural and um, a fantasy adventure. And it's, uh, it's a really fun balancing act. And it was tremendous fun learning how to write a sequel with this book. Cool. That sounds great. So my first question for the panel, and anybody can start off. I will. I'll let you. I'll just fling it open. Why speculative fiction? Why do you work in this in this arena? Are there other genres? I was unaware. Is there? 
well, a few, you know how that goes. But I'm always, I'm always curious about how writers get to to a, a particular genre, you know, whether it's mystery or fantasy or romance or literary fiction. I'll call that a genre. So, but yeah, who wants to take a stab at that? Lucy, you started. Please go ahead. Uh, sure. Uh, part of it is it's just a lot of fun, uh, and as an exercise of playing what if, you know, what if we were invaded by aliens? What if, you know, fairies were real? What if, you know, there were werewolves and vampires? You know, what if all these things uh, existed in our world? Um, you know, what if we lived in the future? What if we lived in the past? Uh, there are a lot of things that you can do with speculative fiction uh, in terms of theme that are difficult to do with just uh, straight on uh, mainstream, completely realistic fiction. Uh, but mostly for myself, it's just I really enjoy writing genre fiction. Uh, for me personally, that's going to be science fiction, fantasy, and horror. So, yeah. Cool. For me, it's what I was drawn to as a kid. And I think a lot of times what we are drawn to, if you're drawn to be a writer, I think you sort of imitate things that you are obsessed with at a young age and that you sort of cut your teeth on. Um, I'm wearing Edgar Allan Poe around my neck and reading him changed my life when I was a kid struggling with depression and I was trying to figure out how can I put my darkness in me into something and I was always kind of into the whole gothic and goth aesthetic and I'm still lifelong goth not a phase um, you know it, and I think that for us it was a like I, I don't want to speak for anybody else in the panel but um, I think that um, I know for me personally the idea of speculative fiction was a way to explore themes that I was trying to work through and also escape into too. So there's a, a mixture of both for me working through a dark side to a place of hope on the other side. Um, I, I love horror fiction and I have elements of it in my work, but I think with speculative fiction, I'm interested in driving towards a more hopeful place. And that was how I was able as a young writer you know, starting my first novel when I was 11 years old, because it was just something I had to do, and it was something I could escape into, and in doing so, feel better. Um, and, and in that, I felt that that escapism was really wondrous. And I do think it allows for us to talk about bigger picture issues. You know, I was always obsessed with things like Star Trek, um, and, 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 and its promise for a better future, too. You know, so even though I write about the 19th century, those were folks at the late 19th century. It's a real change. They were fighting for change. The first civil rights, women's rights, labor rights, so much was changing about our modern world. And there's so many parallels to right now. And when I was reading that, reading 19th century fiction as a kid, I couldn't help but sort of notice parallels to our modern um, scenario. And I still like doubling those things because sometimes you can talk about what's going on now more so by putting it in a fantasy uh, genre in a speculative genre, in a historical fantasy genre, and asking the what if in those ways. Great, anyone else? Why do you write speculative? I, I was just gonna say, I uh, heard an interview recently with Gabriela Pereira and Django Wexler, and they were talking about speculative fiction as literalizing the metaphor. So whatever it is that you're exploring, you can take it as a metaphor or you can push it to another level and you can make it literally. So instead of the guy has boulders for teeth, he literally has boulders for teeth. And you can see what that does. And it gives you a new tool set to explore the issues that you want to talk about and that you want to bring up in a dialogue with your readers. For, for me, getting into uh, science fiction, speculative fiction, um, it was just, it was a natural extension of what I was watching and what I was reading when I was younger. Uh, the first movie I saw in a the theater was probably Star Wars. And from there, I got the Star Wars comic books. And then I started reading all kinds of comic books, uh, science fiction and superheroes and, and all of that. And read so many that finally my dad was like, how about you try reading a sci-fi book? You know, he gave me some, some Clark, some Asimov and some other things. And, uh, and I loved it just as much as I loved reading the comic books. So um, nobody else in my family is really a big genre reader. Uh, maybe my aunt reads, you know, Stephen King, but it's about it, you know? And so I just kind of, the monster movies, the cartoons and all that other stuff uh, just kind of stuck with me. And uh, my, the first thing I ever wrote was a blatant ripoff of uh, Scooby-Doo. So, you know, I, I started with the classics and, and moved on from there. 
Um, but yeah, it was just a, it was just a, a, an extension of what I, I loved as a kid and, and the stories I like to read and the stories, you know, the movies I like to watch and, and stuff like that. It made sense for me to sit down and try and start writing my own stories and finding my own voice for those sort of things. Great. So it sounds like, you know, you're all drawn for different reasons. My, you know, I, lo I know that a lot of folks that will be, uh, uh, you know, coming into this panel are aspiring writers. And I've already heard a couple of you mention this, but have you always wanted to write? How did you get drawn into writing, period? For me, uh, wanting to write was a natural extension of the books that I was reading. Um, the first book that really made me want to become a writer was uh, Madeline Lengel's Wrinkle in Time. I read that book and it just really captured my imagination. And I, I thought to myself, you know what? Somebody wrote this, somebody created this. You know, if I could grow up and write something that made somebody else feel the way that I'm feeling now, that would be a really cool job. And so right from the get-go, I wanted to be a writer. Um, for a long time, I didn't think that I could do it full time. You know, that was, that was, that was not a thing, but luckily I've been able to do it. Uh, more or less full-time freelance for the last couple of years. Um, but yeah, it was, for me, uh, it was the books that I was reading that really set me on the path to wanting to be a writer. How about the rest of you, anybody else? How did you, how did you decide to become a writer? Uh, for me, I, I, I kind of, you know, I, I never really had the idea of being a, a full-time writer or, or, you know, writing novels or anything like that at, at first. I mean, I, I always liked, you know, telling stories and, and like I said, enjoying movies and TV and all this other stuff. But um, I thought I'd give it a shot since I liked that sort of thing in, uh, in college. And uh, I, I was really discouraged by my, by my professors. They, they really wanted you to write a certain thing and really and didn't like what I was writing. They did not want to see the, the guy uh, digging a hole to bury his wife. Uh, they didn't want to see the demons and the, and the, you know, they didn't want to see the rockets. They wanted to see something along this sur this one path. And when you got off of that, I, and I didn't realize it at the time, uh, that this was just one person's opinion. I figured this is a professor, they gotta know what they're talking about. They're, there's, you know, they know. And so I, I stopped writing for uh, probably t five, or, five or 10 years afterwards until I moved to Columbus. And I, uh, I said, you know, I really liked writing. And I, you know, the professor would give me bad marks, but the rest of the class would say, hey, did you ever finish that story you were reading in class? That was great. And, um, so I, I joined a writer's group when I got here to Columbus uh, around 2000 and uh, it really sort of opened my eyes as to what, you know, I, I could do and what everyone else was doing and, you know, really figuring out how to stick to it rather than a couple of, uh, a couple of bad comments and you're done, you know. Um, and once I kind of got into that groove, I, I, I enjoyed it so much that, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to look back. I still had a day job, but, you know, my extra hours were all writing from there on, I think. Great. Dan, Leanna? I, I think for, for me, it was an extension just of, I was sort of a natural born storyteller as a kid. And so I didn't really ever think about it as a profession, not as a kid. I was the kid who would tell the ghost stories to my Girl Scout troop and terrify them. And I found that to be extremely gratifying and empowering. <laughs> and, and I just, you know, f felt that the the call of storytelling, however that led me, whether it was to stage work or whether I was writing things down, um, I knew that storytelling was where I needed to go. The particulars of that profession, um, I was sort of, you know, really going in, I went into theater school because theater was the thing I sort of did publicly and writing was the thing that I did privately because writing was a little bit closer to my heart. Theater was something that I just had a whole lot of fun with and people told me I was decent at. Um, so I thought, all right, we'll do this and then I'll write on the side. And then in college, you know, I was working on this novel for a very long time, just in the background. And my college roommate was like, you know, no one else who's not also a writer, you know, spends all day in rehearsal and then goes and works on their novel. You might also think that you might also be a novelist. And I was like, huh, yeah, maybe that actually is maybe it's kind of true. And I still prof uh, went the professional theater route and kind of kept writing in the background. But then at a certain point, there was this novel that I started working on, and that became a really so close to my heart. And I was at a Broadway callback when I moved to New York, and all I could think about was my book. And so I just stopped auditioning and sort of shifted gears. And and within the next couple of years, I got a publication contract. And I'm, I still keep theater in my life, and I still do performance. But writing is really now at the forefront. And I think it was just for me, it just needed to be 
I needed to get to the point where it was the most important thing um, and not just something I enjoyed doing. Uh, but as all of us will say, when you start to do this professionally, it's different than when you first start out doing it because you love it. Um, that's another conversation, but um, it was an interesting meandering path, but my theater uh, performance degree and all of my work in theater directly informs my writing. So I always say to folks, have more than one thing that you love to do because it will inevitably inspire your writing and make it all the richer. Cool, Dan? Um, well, I think like a lot of the other people on the panel, I started really young reading and making up stories about my little action figures and stuff like that. And I always wanted to be a writer and I tried, I took classes and I, I did things, but really all I was doing was brief character studies and vignettes. Um, or scene description. And I learned how to write on a line level, um, but I, I didn't know how to tell a story. Uh, and then in 2011, my father died and I was asked to give the eulogy at his funeral. And I did. And it, the, the story I told there was the first time I told a capital S story. For the first time, I had something that I wanted to say beyond the immediate constraints of 800 words, 3000 words, whatever it was, there was a bigger message. And when people were coming up to me and telling me how much it meant to them, it started to sink in. And then the priest who had presided at the funeral came up and asked if he could take it and give it at other funerals. And I said, I've clearly done something good here, um, even in tragic circumstances. And I took what I learned on that day and I, moved forward from there. And that's what kind of tipped me over the edge from somebody who really loved reading and loved trying to write to somebody who's really interested in stories and narrative. Great, what a very interesting story all of you had. A couple of you have mentioned things that made me think, um, I heard Matt mention writers group. So what advice do you have for aspiring writers? I mean, we, we all, anybody that's familiar with this industry knows it can be difficult to break into it. So what do you, what's your advice for people out there trying? My first bit of advice, I guess it's two things is, first of all, write, you need to write, keep writing, keep trying to improve your skill set as a writer, but also don't give up. Um, I went to the uh, Clarion Science Fiction and Fantasy Workshop, um, which was really um, instrumental for me, you know, developing personal contacts and things like that, and sort of having a cohort of up and coming writers to, uh, you know, uh, get beta reads from, to, you know, get moral support from, and all of that. Um, but there were some people at the workshop who are writing phenomenal stories, uh, really, really good writers, uh, but they haven't been published since then because other things in their life came along that were more important to them and they just kind of quit writing. But those of us who stuck with it, you know, uh, we've all got writing careers at this point. Um, it's, it takes a really long time. Uh, some people get lucky and the first thing that they do uh, goes really well and is really well received and gets a lot of publicity and suddenly they're famous. But for most of us, it's kind of a long haul process. You're going to have ups and downs. I think of it a lot like being a rodeo rider, like and getting like your big book contract is like getting on a nice big bull. The bull is going to buck you off. It's a matter of time, but just try to do your best while you're on the bull and then have a plan for what happens when you inevitably get bucked off and you find yourself in the sawdust, you know, um, and, and have a plan for when that happens. But yeah, so it'll have ups and downs. Um, it's kind of a crazy ride, uh, but just don't give up. Just stick with it. That, that's, that's great. Go ahead, Matt. Sorry. And sometimes you're the rodeo clown with the bull charging right at you, trying to get out of the way before something bad happens. Um, no, absolutely. Um, uh, staying, staying with it. Uh, there were many times where I was thinking maybe I was going to give up on this. And uh, I, like I said, I started with this writing group in 2000. I probably didn't get anything published until maybe 2005. And that was short stories and poetry. And my first novel didn't, uh, didn't actually come out until 2013. So, and that's after submitting and, putting one in the drawer and, and writing a whole new book and submitting to another agent, submitting to publishers, and, and then uh, finally getting a break because I kept at it and because, you know, I had something at the right time. Um, it's, it's keeping at it. And, and even if you're not getting published, the more you write, the more comfortable you are with your own writing, I think, and you find your voice and you find what you're trying to do. Um, and yeah, I discovered that through, you know, a lot of different versions of, of different stories and things. 
Um, my other my other advice is always, and I, and I think everybody gives us at some point, is to read. You know, read as much as you can get your hands on, um, so you see and, and you can get a feel for how books work, how a story works. Whether you have that education as to you know here's the plot point and here's this and this, you get a feel for stories, even if you don't have that sort of you know training to to sit down and, and chart it out. Um, but the more you read, the more you see what's going on out there and what's come before you. And you also get to see, you know, even reading things you may not like. I mean, like a book that is just not your thing. If you read it, you get to see maybe why it's popular for other people, why other people might enjoy it. And that might inform your own writing as well. But I, I mean, there were times when I was reading, you know, two or three books at a time just because I was just absorbing things, you know, I was absorbing, you know, how nonfiction and how fiction and science fiction differ, you know. Um, but that's, that's usually my first advice is to read everything you can get your hands on and uh, it'll prep you for whatever you're going to do in the future. Good advice. Dan, Leanna? I definitely think um, echoing what uh, certainly Lucy and Matt's experiences of, of being in community with people whether it's writers groups or a class as, as iconic as Clarion. Um, for me, it was joining local writers groups in New York City. And thankfully that's you know the heart of the publish, publishing industry. And I knew that when I moved here, because when I moved to New York, I was like, I don't know, I really wanna do theater. I really wanna do publishing. Well, both of those capitals are kind of in New York. And so there definitely location was helpful for me. But you know, as, things continue to, especially during the pandemic, we're realizing like, you know, not everything needs to be based in one city. And, you know, so you can find your local writers groups, no matter where you are, um, and get a few people who are really, who you feel like you can get along with well, who can be critique partners for you. Don't necessarily get 20 critique partners, because then it's a little bit like a little too hard to keep track of, but get a few people who you trust, who also won't only tell you nice things, like who will gently be like, this is what isn't working for me. Um, and if you find that lots of people are saying that there's a sticking point with one of the things in your books, that then there's probably a sticking point and then it's up to you to fix it. So I definitely feel like having other eyes on your work is very important because then you also get used to taking feedback because if you cannot take feedback and if you cannot accept edits and editorial feedback, you cannot be a writer because not everything that comes out of you <laughs> so I, I rely heavily on my editors and they're wonderful and have made my books better every single time that they have anything to say. Um, and because I can always address, even if I don't want to necessarily fix it in the way that they want me to fix it, I can definitely find a way to address their, their issues. So, um, so definitely community is great. And the, the broader and the more diverse that community can be, the better your storytelling is going to be because the world is full of all kinds of different people. Um, so, you know, really expanding your ideas and, and, you know, following people on Twitter who are from different backgrounds and different, you know, just taking in different cultural viewpoints, uh, identity viewpoints, um, that's also going to just make your, your worldview all the richer and more um, expansive and also more true to life or fantasy, but because that needs to be just as imaginative as all of us are too, so. Great advice, a thick skin is very important. Dan? <laughs> Um, one really useful thing to remember is that everyone's journey is unique. And when you look at other writers, you can learn from their experiences. You can listen to uh, a, a group like this and hear the things that we're saying, but keep in mind that these are the things that we've learned and that applied to us. And what applies to you is going to be slightly different. And the really tricky part of learning that lesson is the things that apply to you today will not apply to you in four years and they wouldn't have applied to you four years ago. And you have to have the humility to accept that it's a constantly moving target. It's, um, it's like riding a bike a little bit in that you have to constantly be shifting to keep your balance. If you do it for long enough, you get good and you don't notice that you're doing it, but you are. You are constantly being thrown off balance and recentering yourself. And if you ever stop adapting to that, you will absolutely get dumped on your butt. Great advice. Um, another question I always like to ask authors, and you're probably going to cringe, but I'm always fascinated with writers' uh, process. 
you know, do you write in the morning? Do you write in the evening? Do you longhand? Do you type? So if anybody want to take a first stab at process? I always find that fascinating. I think other people are always interested. Like, how do you do it? What, what's your day like? That kind of thing. My process is uh, it's pretty fluid, um, and it depends on. Uh, we mentioned before the podcast started that I'm home with my kids, and they, they, you know, through everything that's been going on, they had to have homeschool or had to be home and do everything by computer. Uh, so I really had to adjust and figure out when I could sneak in when they're not. You know, I'm not, I'm not a morning person. I can't write in the morning. I can't function in the morning. Um, I used to be a, a, a late night writer, uh, but I, as I get older, I find I can't keep that schedule up anymore either. So uh, really, it's 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 getting a schedule with my kids, getting a schedule with any everything else that's going on, and then saying, okay, there's a gap here where I can either, you know, I can sit there and watch TV or I can write a chapter, or I can work on an outline or I can, you know, edit a few pages. Um, and, and last year when with the kids, I really got into a great schedule where I could write, a, had a couple blocks here and there that I could write. And now that they're home in the summer, it's a little off again, but um, it, it really, uh, it's really finding those gaps for me. When I used to have a nine to five, I would go, uh, at my lunch hour and I would write for 45 minutes at the McDonald's down the street. And, uh, then I would plan what I was going to write in my head in the drive home and, you know, the drive to work. And then I would go to McDonald's the next day and I'd write it. Um, only because that's the only way I could really do it because that's when the kids were younger, they were in school, we had to have dinner, we had to get them to, you know, um, so I, my, my process is very, very fluid. When, when I have a, a strict deadline, I can, you know, I, I'll plan it out and say, okay, you guys are going to disappear for a couple of hours and mom's going to take care of you while I write two hours a day, every day or whatever at this particular time. But for me, it's just get it when you can um, and, you know, set some goals, make sure you meet those goals. And if you don't, you know, don't beat yourself up about it, but find a way to either uh, make those goals more realistic or find a way to stretch yourself to meet those goals. And that's kind of the way I've been writing my last few. Great. Tell us about their process. My process is very different than Matt's, uh, at least in terms of the timing. I'm a binge writer. Um, I tend to prefer to write, uh, you know, over long, long sessions. I've tried, uh, you know, writing during, you know, 15 minute, 45 minute chunks, um, and I just really can't do it very well. Um, it, it feels like I've just kind of gotten in the groove and then I have to quit. Um, and I find that pretty frustrating. Um, luckily, I've been able to work my schedule mostly so that I have the time that I need. I don't necessarily write fiction every day. I do write something every day, but frequently it's nonfiction or, you know, uh, gaming or something else that I'm doing. Um, but I tend to write to deadlines just because I have them and they're very motivational. Uh, but yeah, I, I uh, prefer to binge um, sometimes, and I hate this because, you know, again, I like to keep responsible adult hours like everybody else does, uh, but I do my best work really late at night. Like if I stay up all night and, um, you know, write from like 1 a.m. until 6 a.m., I can frequently get a whole lot of writing done that for some reason it just doesn't work during daylight hours. Um, I can't do that too often um, anymore uh, because, again, I am trying to be, you know, awake when normal people are awake. Um, so I kind of have to work against my own impulses a lot of the time, but, you know, I make it work. Um, my life would be a lot simpler if I were slow and steady, you know, two hours every day kind of writer, but that's just not the process that I have. So. Wow. One to six. That's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, no, I'm totally with Lucy on this one. I am an I am a night owl, um, and yeah, if I if I had my way and didn't have to be up in business hours to to you know handle queries from my editors or my publicists or whatever, it's like, yeah, no, writing through the night that that's my ideal uh, creative time. Um, I've always been a night owl, so I think um, understanding when is your when is the time that you are most energized and trying to find time within that, that you can be creative in your highest uh, creative productive time. Um, and, and that's gonna change depending on life. Um, so yeah, I'm a little bit also though of Matt's process of, of try to get in while you can. I've been a freelancer so long, I don't, I, I don't really know what a regimented schedule looks like. One of my days is never like the next day. So I just sort of try to take it as it comes and try to, I don't necessarily write every day because I, I don't necessarily have the ability to because I have a different project that's come up in the meantime, but I will definitely write every week 
multiple times within a week. It's just a matter of like of setting aside those chunks, but they have to be long enough. Like Lucy said, they have to be long enough so that I can really get in the zone. Um, otherwise it is like, I've just, you know, I've just gotten used to the water and then have to jump back out. So it does have to be long enough for it to, to be meaningful. So I think carving out, making time for it, you have to make time for it. And I'm a very nonlinear writer, so I don't write in order. I write the scenes that I want to write and I will then stitch them together. I will write the scenes that sort of come to my mind the first, because that's the stuff that wants to be written. The, and so I will run with that momentum and that energy to make sure that that word count gets out. I can refine it later. Uh, so writing the, th the scenes that come to you. You don't don't pause because you're like, oh, well, I, we're not to that point in the narrative yet. No, go ahead, write it. <laughs> use use that creative juices however you can because you know sometimes they might not be there the next day. Um, so there's no perfect time for any of this. You just have to make it and you have to work with it um, and get as comfortable with your own process as possible and try not to edit yourself too much terribly when you're first drafting um because that's that will stop you and you won't get very far down the line so i try to just bomb it out of first draft um and and go back later to clean it up try not to stop and cringe too often just keep going and if i focus on my characters most rather than the w whether the sentences are polished if i focus on the characters then that's how i can stay uh looking ahead and not fussing with it too much in the meantime i like that vomit out the first edition and edit later <laughs> Dan, what's your process like? Um, there, there's really two elements to it. Uh, the first is I thrive on novelty. So I have to change something up. If I find a new routine, it's really productive for me for about six months and then it starts turning into diminishing returns. Um, so if I can, I can work from home when I first started writing full time and I was like, great, this is awesome. And then I was, you know, the, the dishwasher needed to be dealt with or the dog needed to be dealt with or whatever it was, there was always something. And then I learned that I had to leave the house for a while and I was going to a co-working space. And about six months after that, I was finding reasons to kind of wander around down to the park near there. So I always have to be finding new constraints and new challenges to keep me, um, it's, it's not engaged, it's to keep me focused and to keep me turned away. Um, and the other, aspect of it for me is that I used to work on the, um, the assembly line at Honda and <clears throat> I approach all my writing sessions like I'm on the line, right? The line starts and I'm writing um, and at Honda, anyone can stop the line if there's a medical emergency, you know, right? Like the dog needs to go outside or I need to go to the bathroom, right? Like no poop on the floor. That's generally the goal. Um, otherwise, I just sit in my chair and keep working and um, stay at it. Sound, sound advice. Um, bouncing back from writing a little bit, let's bounce back to your works, uh, that your Ohioana works. What inspired the, your, the work that, we, that you originally introduced? So um, who wants to take a stab at that one? Like, why did you write this current work? I'll pick on Matt. I was going to say, uh, well, I probably have the easiest way reason for, for my current work is um, I was approached by uh, the gentleman, uh, Christopher Paul Carey, who eventually became the editor uh, or the uh, director of publications for Edgar Rice Burroughs, Inc. And uh, I had originally, a few years ago, had uh, sent him some samples of my work when he worked for a gaming company about, you know, they were looking for somebody to write some books and some stuff for them. And I didn't work out, I, it didn't work for them at the time, but when he moved to this new position for Edgar Rice Bros, he remembered my work, thankfully, and said, hey, would you consider uh, working with us because we're going to sort of reboot all of these, or not reboot, excuse me, we're going to uh, pick up where uh, Burroughs left off with all of these characters, would you be interested in working with us? And so... Um, of course, I was interested in, they just uh, were, were trying to figure out what character to start with, with this new series. Um, and so I was uh, sort of in a, in a holding pattern for a while because I didn't, I couldn't really start brainstorming until I knew who I was brainstorming for. Um, we decided on this character, uh, Carson Napier, who uh, crash lands on Venus. And um, so before everything got official, he's like, well, you know, brush up on it. So I started reading. Luckily for me, uh, the Carson series only has a few books, a handful of books. Uh, if it had been Tarzan, you know, there's like 28, 29 books in, in that series that, that uh, to, to brush up on and get familiar with. But uh, I, I sat there uh, reading these, these 
same book over and over. And uh, I even had, uh, I don't know if you have the text to speech on your phone. I had the mechanical voice read the books to me, which was awful. Um, but it, it was uh, from the first book I read, I already had this idea. I had this question. So I had to read on to see if they ever answered this question. And um, they never answered the question that I had from the first, you know, few pages of the book, uh, first 50 pages, maybe of this first book. So I, I thought about it some more and I started extrapolating from that uh, question that they never answered uh, that really bugged me. I don't know if it bugged anybody else that ever read the books. And so I presented this as part of my idea and they were like, yeah, no, that question never got answered by anybody. I don't think it even people that wrote unofficial books in the series uh, had talked about that and they liked that idea. And so I, I you know, took it a little bit further to see what I thought might happen. Uh, and we discussed it back and forth and said, that'd be great. And uh, so they had me write it up, write, write it up very quickly, uh, luckily, because, um, you know, it was, it was a, like two or three months turnaround time once we got the uh, the outline figured out. But um, that's kind of how I, I wandered into this book. It was, you know, somebody remembered me luckily from another, from another audition sort of, and said, we'd like to work with you. And then them were really liking the idea I came up with, which was, uh, which was fabulous to have, you know, an expert on the subject say, Hey, that's a great idea. You know? Um, so that was, that was a lot of fun. And then, like I said, it kind of snowballed from there where they had me help out with, um, the prequel comics that was going to go to this book and, and a few other elements of the, of the book. So, uh, it was very exciting and it was just sort of, I just sort of rolled with it and kept throwing out ideas and, and, uh, and it was great to work with them and, uh, to set up the series that they're going to have of all these other Canada, you know, uh, characters that are, you know, big deals for Burroughs that are going to start having more books that are going to be canon for the, for, for Burroughs work. Um, it was just a great honor to jump in there and, and sort of run with it and then to enjoy the, where I was running with it. So uh, that's kind of how I got into it. That's how my, this current work got, got going. That's great. And Matt's title again for the viewers, The Edge of All Worlds. Um, mm -hmm. Who want, next wants to talk about what inspired their current, current work? How did, you, how did you start writing? I'll pick on Lucy, Secret Guide to Fighting the Elder Gods. I particularly like that title, Lucy. <laughs> okay, um, Jennifer Brozek, the editor, um, invited me to write for this anthology. The whole anthology was put together uh, through invitations um, and uh, that's pretty common. Um, anyway, uh, she t gave me the basic pitch for the, um, for the anthology was that she was looking for uh, Lovecraftian uh, tales of adventure and magic uh, featuring teen protagonists. So at that point, I just basically brainstormed, uh, you know, a few ideas and um, wrote the story, submitted it, Jennifer liked it, and, uh, you know, she ended up publishing it. Um, and uh, so this is a much more uh, shorter and uh, more straightforward process than if this were a novel or something like that. Um, but yeah, the um, I don't know. I don't know what else to say about it. Like it's a cool collection, and uh, it's been well received. My story in it has been pretty well received. Uh, several reviewers have, you know, picked it out as something that they've liked. Um, so, you know, I think that anybody who um, enjoys uh, Lovecraftian urban fantasy would really enjoy this book, even if they're adults. Uh, although it is aimed at teens. Great. Well, and that's a good point that sometimes you get invited to add to a collection. So that's kind of cool too. So. Dan or Leanna, how which uh, how are you inspired on your current work? And Leanna's work, it looks like she's getting ready to talk Spectral Cities. That yeah, it was, yeah. Nice. So oh. it started with started with the Spectral City. So this is book one. This is book two, Sanctuary of Spirits, and then book three just came out, The Summoning of Souls. And in this trilogy, um, I was also invited to write, uh, or at least propose something for Kensington's new Rebel Baseline. So Kensington Books has long uh, been a publisher of a lot of different genre fiction, and they ha didn't have a dedicated sci-fi fantasy line. So um, my editor approached my agent and said, you know, who of your clients, you know, might be interested in this? And so I had a bunch of proposals that uh, were sort of sitting around, things that um, I knew, you know, uh, I would want to write. So I had the idea already. And so here was an opportunity. And um, my characters tend to be a part of sort of a, a greater Hebrew verse. So um, these are characters who are kind of extensions from my young adult series, um, which began with Darker Still, um, that Magic Most Foul saga. You don't have to have read my other books to have to read this. I definitely, this is a great jumping in point. But 
longtime readers will recognize, oh, this is a family legacy. So I wanted to deal with a couple of different aspects. Um, because each of my works is dealing with some familiar characters, I want to make sure I'm not exploring the same territory as I did the last time, even though thematically I love a good, you know, get the Scooby gang together to save the day. So a scrappy found family of, of folks from different backgrounds who come together to save the day is, is kind of a concurrent theme with all of my work. But in this case, I really wanted the idea, um, like uh, what, was, what Dan was saying about the idea of a, a paranormal procedural. I love that idea and I hadn't really done one that in, in that particular vein where I was creating a, sort of an everyday day-to-day -day, um, operations but doing it in a paranormal way. So trying to really write uh, a mystery novel but with fantasy elements um, because I've been really in into sort of the fantasy side um, and this time I was trying to constrain myself to okay you have to solve at least one of the tiers of the mysteries that you've set up. You have to at least solve one of them at the end of book one. Um, and so in each of the three books, one of the three-pronged mystery gets solved. Um, so mystery readers who are expecting everything to get solved in the first book have been a little frustrated. That's the trouble with cross genre um, is because it's like my fantasy side is like, no, 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 it's got the three book arc. So um, it's been an interesting thing of push and pull of those different elements and trying to make sure that you're at least ma managing some reader expectations. Uh, each genre has them. So um, this was really fun because I wanted to lift up the idea of working women in the late 19th century. There were a lot new technologies and new uh, ways society was changing was allowing for a lot of lower to middle class women to really enter workforces and change their stations and their state for themselves and for others that they wanted to bring with them and help. So uh, spiritualism and the interest in seances and all of that was very much real for the 19th century uh, for those audiences and New York was such a rich space as it still is for immigrant populations from around the world coming together. So it's just such a great dynamic uh, time period of change. And so women in the workforce is not, uh, that's not historically inaccurate. So having a team of women who are working as spiritualists was very much part of what was happening then. So I wanted to both remind folks that, you know, um, the ideas of independent women is not a mo it's not a modern concept that's been around for centuries. And so it's been fun to do that, but also to, you know, just put it in a fun action adventure lots with lots of friendly ghosts too, because, you know, as a ghost tour guide, that's my other, the other side of my life that I wanted to make sure I lifted up and celebrated too. Great. Dan, what inspired your current work? Uh, Titan's Day, uh, like I said, it's a sequel. So it's a combination of trying to look at the promises that I made to the reader at the end of book one and deliver on those to what Leanna was just saying. Um, and, you know, in my first draft, I missed all of them. Like the, it was wrong 100%. So I had to go back and, and redo it and really uh, ask myself, what would the readers want, not what I thought the readers would want, if that makes sense. So learning how to do that was a challenge and really rewarding for me. And the other part of it was I wanted to look at a character who was trapped in huge historical, a huge historical moment in his world, but he doesn't care because he's far more focused on writing a single wrong, on doing one small thing to make the world just a little bit better. And I think the, you know, so a little bit closer to the 2016 election cycle um, and the 2018 election cycle and that idea of how do you live when you feel it's a time of great change, but still focus on these small goals that aren't gonna change the world, but they might change things for one person in one way. And that's still a totally legitimate goal. That's still something worth fighting for. And monsters, so. Great. Um, you've all at some point mentioned reading, um, and I've heard a lot of readers say you can't write without being a reader. Um, what do you all like to read and have you been reading more during the pandemic or are you balancing out your reading and your writing? So I'll just toss out the reading question there and ask what are you reading or what have you read or have you, have you not been able to read because you're stressed? <laughs> I Kind of, yeah, for me it's been, I haven't read a whole lot uh, during the pandemic, um, mainly keeping busy and, and also I just having a hard time focusing in general on stuff like that. But as, as someone who loves sci-fi and horror, I think 
probably my favorite genre to read is crime novels. I think, you know, I love, love Elmore Leonard. I, I love Carl Hyacin, um, and, and, uh, you know, uh, Tony Hillerman has some good, uh, some good crime stories. Um, I don't know. I don't know how I got into that, you know, it's, but it's, it's, I think it's because it's not my genre. It's, you know, something entirely different that I can kind of study and read and, and forget about the sort of sci-fi conventions and horror conventions and things like that. Um, I'm, you know, I'm a Stephen King fan. I, I like a lot of other science fiction, but uh, I'm, I'm really kind of into crime right now. <laughs> uh, just as a reader, not into crime in general. I'm, I'm you know, staying home like everyone else uh, and reading, reading about crime. That's what I'm doing. Thanks for clarifying that. <laughs> Thing on straight and narrow there. Anyone else? What are you reading right now, or are you able to read? Or I've had a hard time a bit uh, staying focused on it. So I'm just I'm honestly just not judging myself. I'm just kind of you know peppering here and there with us. I have a lot of research that I'm doing. I'm I'm uh, in the process of uh, nonfiction book. So there's a lot of reading that I'm doing for that. So um, there's a lot of research reading that I'm doing and. But in terms of, you know, trying to support my friends, you know, all, we have authors as friends and a lot of us are trying to keep up with their latest releases. Um, and two of them that I really love uh, recently, uh, Zoraida Cordova did a beautiful YA book called Incendiary. And it's a great book, um, sort of based on a fantastical premise, but with elements of the Spanish Inquisition. So I really want to be reading diversely, um, reading different, you know, backgrounds, different mythologies, um, reading authors of color. Um, my dear friend, Shveta Thakrar just released a beautiful book called Star Daughter, which has some Hindu mythology that's uh, part of her work. And it's just a gorgeous, gorgeous book. Um, and also, you know, uh, another book that really captured my heart recently is um, Nehisi Coates, uh, The Water Dancer, gorgeous prose is there. So, you know, trying to read stuff that is, you know, um, supporting uh, diversity in publishing, which is really an important aspect as well. Um, so I thankfully, I have a long reading list of, of friends of mine who are writing really great for, works. So um, my, my to be read pile is always very long, but that's a good thing. So I always, I always buy the books, even if I can't get to them right away. Because um, supporting supporting uh, friends is, is a great part of the business. That's really, yeah, that's important advice. Yeah, that's good. Dan or Lucy, how's your, how's your reading world been lately? I tend to do a lot of reading as a part of my work. I uh, work as a freelance developmental editor, so I've been reading a lot of novels in progress and uh, uh, making critiques on them, making suggestions on them, marking them up and things like that. Um, and I can't really talk about titles since they're all, you know, in progress and haven't been really sold yet. Um, because of the pandemic, I find myself reading a lot of nonfiction articles on virology and things like that. I, I've read a lot of short nonfiction since the pandemic started. Um, in terms of, I won't even necessarily call this pleasure reading, uh, it's just a book that has been on my to be read list for kind of a while now. Uh, but I started recently started uh, Matt Ruff's Lovecraft Country, um, you know, partly to find out, you know, uh, what's going on with the book and things like that. Since I myself write so much Lovecraftian fiction, it's always good to keep up on what other people have been writing that's been popular. So, yeah. Good point. Dan, what have you been reading? Uh, I have a, a stack of shame of to be read books that, uh, you know, a lot of them, like you guys were saying, a lot of them are my friends, uh, books that have come out and I just never got a chance to read them. So I've been trying to really spend time working my way through those. Um, and I ended up writing out all their names on little slips of paper and I put them all into a big uh, Tupperware <laughs> thing. And whenever I'm ready for a new book, I just pull it out and I check it out and I just go read that one. Um, cool. Cause it's too easy to get distracted with whatever the newest thing is. Uh, and the other stack just doesn't get touched. Uh, right now I'm reading Noel Salazar's The Flight Girls, um, which is a historical drama. It's, fantastic. I love it. And I'm reading Scared Sacred, which is a nonfiction collection of essays on um, religion in horror film. I love that Tupperware method. That's great. <laughs> We're getting close to the end of our panel. Is there anything anybody wants to share? I know sometimes you're on a panel and you're like, why didn't they ask this? Or I want to share this. I just want to give you an opportunity if there's anything you wanted to share or um, mention about writing, reading your books, that kind of thing before we wrap up here. 
a great resource right now that's helping a lot of independent bookshops is a, a site called bookshop.org. So if you, you know, want to get a book and you want to support independent bookstores, they've been able to give about a, m millions of dollars to local independent bookstores that are struggling right now. So I think just as, you know, in terms of the book industry, um, definitely if you can, you know, pop into bookshop.org and support a local bookstore. Uh, IndieBound is another way to look for great books and that you can match that up with your zip code and get uh, support local independent shops there too. And also I think a lot of readers don't know that you can um, request titles at your library and libraries are so great and libraries are so important, but it's also great to keep up with whatever their social distancing is happening and, and their health as well. But you can request titles at the library and that's a huge help for authors because libraries buy the books from the publishers and so um you know request if you don't see you know if you want to help your friends who are writers um request our titles at your local library um and then you know that just proves that there's interest um and that's a huge way to help uh and i just think right now the making sure that we are looking out for small uh businesses and and small creators and artists in general um that's just a wonderful way that you can a couple of different sites you can and and ways you can support all of us Great reminder, Leanna. And yes, you're right. Libraries are a lot of libraries are open for. I uh, know here in Columbus, they're open up for curbside service. So you're right. You can request stuff and go pick it up. So you can be safe and read too. Anybody else have anything that they wanted to add, or just like, why didn't she ask me that? <laughs> uh, for me, I, uh, I when I'm on a lot of uh, groups and, and things on Facebook and other places, and it always kind of drives me mad when people come in and they don't do any research and they say, "How do I do? How do I write this? Or how do I do this?" when there's so many resources out there and uh, I've started going to uh, YouTube and, and listening to lectures and some of the book tubers and things like that. There's so many people that do such a great job of covering the basics or even the more advanced stuff in publishing and in writing, you know, how to write a query letter, how to do this and how to do that. Um, that would be so much better than, than going to a forum and, and asking somebody to type out, how do I write a query letter or what, what do you recommend? There's a lot of really great resources on there. And I usually sort of thumb my nose at YouTube because my kids watch all these video game uh, YouTube videos and it drives me kind of nuts. But I found some really good resources from publishers and writers alike that um, maybe I'm not going to follow. Like somebody mentioned earlier, maybe that's not the way I'm going to do it. But it's certainly another view that maybe I hadn't considered on how to write or how to go about, you know, going to a conference or meeting other authors or something else. Um, I'm, uh, I haven't done a lot of reading, like I said, but I have watched a lot of great videos on YouTube that uh, really delve into writing and publishing quite a bit. Great advice. Thank you, Dan. I want to echo Matt's suggestion for YouTube. There's some really great stuff up there. Um, if you're an aspiring uh, science fiction writer, um, there's a lot of information at the Science Fiction Fantasy Writers of America, um, sfwa.org. Uh, visit there. Uh, you'll find a ton of resources. If you're a horror writer, go to the Horror Writers Association, which is um, hwa.org. And um, yeah, there's, there's just a lot out there. Um, and, and it's a really great time to be a writer because there's so much information just freely available that wasn't back in the day. Good advice. Dan, any final thoughts? Um, <clears throat> just that writing is, so much of writing is putting yourself in somebody else's place. And it's an act of sustained empathy and reading is sliding into somebody else's worldview. And that's an act of sustained empathy. And we need that in the world. So whether you're a writer and you have a story to tell, or you're a reader and you want to experience the world through somebody else's eyes, please do it. Share your stories, experience somebody else's life because we need more empathy and we need that activity and that engagement in the world. I think that's a fitting end to this wonderful panel. Thank you very much, Dan. Um, I want to thank everybody. It's been a great pleasure to talk with each of you this evening. Uh, thanks again to Matt Betts and Leanna Renee Heber, Lucy Snyder and Dan Stout for sharing their wisdom. And uh, we really appreciate that. A reminder that you can all get copies of the books by each one of our authors from the Book Loft of German Village at bookloft.com. Going back to what Leanna said, let's support our authors, right? Thanks again to our festival sponsors and partners. And thank you for joining us. Please check out the Ohioana website for all this year's festival programming.